Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Level Automotive. Welcome back to part two of fixing the wiper blades on this 1999 Ford F-150. Now I know some of you guys might be thinking a two-part series to fix some wiper blades seems a little bit excessive and I get it, but you guys have to understand that I'm trying to cram as much knowledge and information into each video as I can. I mean, that's really the whole purpose of this channel. I'm just trying to help you guys build a foundation so that you can take this knowledge and use it in whatever it is you're trying to diagnose. Because honestly guys, in a real world setting, I would have already fixed this truck. It would have already been gone. I'm not just trying to drag out this diagnosis. I am just trying to help you guys realize that whatever it is you're working on, it's really important to sit down and take a moment to understand how the system works before you go and try to diagnose anything. Because ultimately it can save you a lot of time and a lot of headache because there's a lot less of a chance that you're gonna misdiagnose it. Anyways, if you guys watch part one, you'll know that where we left off, we were suspecting a bad GEM module, but of course, in order to verify that, we wanted to check the main powers and grounds to the module. So we're gonna go ahead and head over to the wiring diagram, try to locate these powers and grounds so that we can check them on the vehicle. Something I wanted to note real quick before we move back over to the computer to check the wiring diagram. If any of you guys are familiar with Ford and the GEM modules, you'll know that the GEM module is used for various different functions on the vehicle. And I guess that's what I wanted to do before we move back over to the wiring diagram is I wanted to check to see what else on the vehicle wasn't operating. So the first thing I noticed is that the radio is not powering on. You guys see I can push this button. It does not power on. The display doesn't come on. There's no sound. Now, I don't know if the radio is directly powered by the GEM module, but I do know for a fact that the door jar switches are wired directly to the GEM module. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the door real quick. And when I open the door, you should hear a chime and there should be a sign that comes on that says door ajar. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the door. As you guys can see, the door is open. We do not have any chime nor do we have a warning for the door jar. Like I said, I just wanted to see if there was any other functions that weren't working. And for sure right now, what I can tell you is that the door jar switches should be causing this instrument panel to chime. Okay guys, so we're looking at the wiring diagram for the GEM module. It's on two different pages. We're gonna go ahead and start on the left side here. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in. And what I want you guys to notice is that if you pay attention, there's actually two main components that this diagram is composed of. So if you look at this outer box, this dotted line that's highlighted right now, if you scroll up, you can see that it's labeled the central junction box under left side of dash. So what that's referring to is the fuse box inside of the vehicle. Now, if we scroll down and you take a look at this other box that's inside of the fuse box, you'll see that it's labeled GEM. So what it looks like according to this diagram is that the GEM module is located inside of the central junction box or the fuse box that's inside of the vehicle. Now this kind of threw me off a little bit, uh, so I had to do a little bit of research. So I went ahead and I used Google Images to search for a picture of the GEM module. And if you take a look, you can see that this module has a connector right here, along with three other connectors here on the side. So after doing a little bit more research, I found out that this GEM module is actually bolted directly to the fuse box and this connector here, this red connector, is actually directly plugged in to the back of the fuse box. So let me show you guys a picture of the fuse box. You'll see the back of the fuse box has this male connector here. And the GEM module has this female connector here. So this GEM module actually mates up to the fuse box. And that's how it makes its electrical connection to the fuse box. There is no physical wiring between the fuse box and the GEM module. So that does make it a little bit interesting because all of our powers that we need to check are fed into the GEM module through this connector here. These other connectors on the side are mainly outputs and inputs for the different components that the GEM module controls. Anyway, so now that we understand that, let's move back to the wiring diagram. Okay, once again, we're back at the wiring diagram. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to locate our main powers and grounds. Again, this is our GEM module right here. It's drawn up like it's inside of the fuse box but actually it's bolted up to the back side of the fuse box. So simple enough, we're gonna go down the list here and we're going to read the different descriptions that we have and we're gonna to try to identify which one of these are main powers and grounds. So if you take a look at pin three over here, you'll see it says ignition run. That's going to be an ignition power feed. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight this wire here. And if we follow it up, you'll see that it comes from this fuse number six here, which is a five amp fuse that's located inside of the fuse box. And if you follow this back out through the fuse and out of the fuse box, 
you'll see here it says hot in run. So what that means is that the ignition switch has to be in the run position in order for there to be power uh, coming through this fuse number six. So this is an ignition power feed. We are only gonna have power through this fuse with the ignition switch on. Now, if we scroll back down to the GEM module, we can move down to pin number four and you'll see here it says power B positive. So B positive means that it's gonna be a battery voltage. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight this pin number four. And what you'll notice is that when I highlighted this wire here, uh, it actually has a splice. So this wire not only feeds pin number four, if we highlight it down here, you'll see that it also feeds pin number 16. And if you look at the description for pin number 16, it also says power B positive. So let's go ahead and follow this out up to the top. And you'll see that it comes from fuse number 15, which is a five amp fuse. And if you look at the top here, you'll see that this fuse has power at all times. What that means is that it's a direct connection to the positive battery feed, which is noted by the description. Again, it says battery positive B plus. Next up, we'll move down to pin number five. And if you look at the description here, it says ignition start park neutral. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight pin number five. And we're going to go ahead and follow it up. And what you'll notice is that it comes from fuse number 20, which is also a five amp fuse. If you take a look at the top of the fuse here, it says hot in start. So what that means is that the ignition switch has to be in the start or the crank position. Only during that momentary crank is this fuse going to have power. So moving back down to the GEM module, the last one that we have is going to be pin number 13. And if you read the description, it says ignition, accessory, or run. So we're going to go ahead and highlight this, pin number 13, follow it up, and you'll see that it goes to fuse number 8, which is also a 5 amp fuse. And if you read the top here, it says that that fuse is hot in run or in the accessory position. So now that we know that our four main powers come from these four fuses here, it's actually pretty simple to check them because, again, if you guys understand, there is no physical wiring between the GEM module and this fuse box. We can actually just go directly to the fuse box and check these fuses to make sure that none of them are blown. Now, not only do we need to verify that none of these fuses are blown, we also need to verify whether or not we're getting power coming into these fuses when there should be. For example, if we found that we didn't have power getting to this fuse number six in the run position, then we know that we need to attack the ignition switch because that's gonna be the input that feeds the power to this fuse. Now, the only other thing that needs to be checked is going to be the ground, and that you're gonna find it here on this next page. Again, if you guys recall, the GEM module has three other connectors coming out of the side, and one of those connectors actually does include the ground. So if I highlight this pin number 26 here, and it's also gonna highlight pin number 14 at the same time because these both share the same ground here, and it shows us that that ground is located on the lower left kick panel. So even though our powers can be checked by just checking the fuses here, our ground, we are going to have to locate the wires on the side of the GEM module. Again, just to give you guys a visual, this red connector is where our main powers are. And again, we're gonna check these by checking the fuses and our ground is gonna be located on one of these three connectors here on the side. Okay, so now we know what we need to do. Let's go ahead and move over to the vehicle and check these four fuses. All right, guys, so moving back over to the vehicle, we're gonna go ahead and check our fuses. Once again, we're gonna be looking at fuse number six, fuse number eight, fuse number 15 and fuse number 20. Now I've already gone ahead and located the fuses. And as you guys can see, I have my test light here. It is connected to this ground on this bracket. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you guys the fuses. Now they are all five amp fuses, so they're pretty easy to identify. Let's start over here. This is going to be fuse number six. This is going to be fuse number eight. This is going to be fuse number 15. And this is going to be fuse number 20 down here. Now, like we talked about, fuse number six and fuse number eight are only going to have a power whenever the ignition switch is on. As opposed to fuse number 15, this is going to have a power all the time. And then of course, fuse number 20 is gonna be the one that has a power during the cranking position. So right now the key is not in the ignition. So we can start by checking uh, fuse number 15. We should have a power on both sides of this fuse. I'm gonna go ahead and touch it. You guys can see I'm not showing a power here. Let me check the other side of the fuse. Okay, you guys see that? Our test light is lit. Let me go back to the other side of this fuse. You guys can see the test light is not lighting 
on this side of the fuse. Okay, so already right off the bat, it looks like we might have a blown fuse as far as fuse number 15 goes. So before we go any further, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this fuse out and take a look at it. So I got this little fuse puller. I'm just going to snatch this fuse out. Let's take a close look at it. There we go. Okay, so hopefully this is showing up on the camera, but if you guys look, this fuse is blown. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside and we're gonna go ahead and turn the ignition on and we're gonna check fuses number six and number eight. I got the key right here. I'm gonna go ahead and stick it into the ignition, turn the ignition on. Now let's move back down to the fuse box. Okay, so let's go ahead and start by checking fuse number six. You guys can see our test light is lit. I'm gonna check the other side of the fuse. And as you guys can see, our test light is lit. So that fuse is good. Let's go ahead and move to fuse number eight. I'm gonna check this side. Again, you guys can see the test light is lit. I'm gonna check the other side of the fuse and the test light is lit. So now we know that uh, both of these fuses, six and number eight, are good. The only thing left to check is fuse number 20. Now, of course, like I said, fuse number 20 is only going to have power in the start or the crank position. So if you see, I'm gonna go ahead and touch this. The test light is not lighting when I touch either side of this fuse. It's only going to light whenever I crank the engine. Okay, so I don't know if this is gonna show up on camera or not. I'm going to attempt to crank the engine over and take a look at the test light. All right, so hopefully you guys were able to see it. The test light did light during the cranking position. So we know that that circuit is good. Okay guys, so I've got a replacement fuse here. I'm gonna go ahead and stick it in to the fuse box and we're going to see if we can get these wiper blades to work. So it's gonna go into this slot here. Did you guys hear that? As soon as I put the fuse in, the door jar is chiming. I think we just woke up this GEM module. So let's find out if these wiper blades work. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the switch and we are back in business. All right, guys, so as you can see, the wiper blades are working. I'm gonna go ahead and shut them off. You can see they go back to their park position. I'm gonna put it somewhere in the middle as far as the intermittent function. You guys can see there's a delay between the operation of the windshield wiper motor. See that? Now, next up, what we could try to do is turn the switch off and we're going to push it and see if the washers work. Bam, looks like everything is working now. All right guys, so just for grins and giggles, I've got the scan tool connected. I wanna go in here and I wanna see if we can communicate with the GEM module. And also I wanna take a look at those data pids and I wanna see uh, what they're supposed to be. Okay, so I'm gonna go into system selection and we're going to try to communicate with the GEM module. And as you guys can see, we now have communication. We're gonna go into the data stream. We're gonna read the data stream and see what data pids we can pick up from this module. Okay, so as you can see, we have uh, several different data pids, but what I want to do is I want to focus on the data pids for the wiper system. Let me go ahead and scroll down here. I'm going to pick anything that's related to the wiper motor. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And these are our selected data pids. You guys can look through here and see what they are. Now at the moment, the wiper motor is not on. I have the switch set to the off position. So if you guys look at the data pids here, uh, you're going to find that the windshield wiper status is in the parked position and the wiper motor control select is in the off position. So I guess what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to flip the switch uh, to the first position, which is going to be an intermittent position. So I'm going to go ahead and flick it and pay attention to those data pids. You guys see how this switched over to interval and you guys can look at this windshield wiper status. You see it's parked at the moment and whenever it turns it on, it's going to switch over. You guys see that it says wipe and then parked. Now I'm gonna go ahead and switch it up to the next. Now you guys can see that the wiper control mode select is set to the low position. And as you guys can see, the wiper blades are at their low speed. Now if we go ahead and move the switch over to the high position, as you guys can see, we have the switch all the way to the high position. We take a look at the scan tool. You can see the wiper control mode select is set to high. Now take a look at the wiper blades. You can see they're moving at their highest speed. So we know everything here is operating. Again, this is a really quick way for you guys to identify whether or not you have a problem with the multifunction switch. Again, you should be able to move the switch to the off position and you'll see that mode select, it'll switch over to the off position. You can put it anywhere in the middle and it should switch over to the interval. You guys could see the interval. And if we put it to the 
low position, which is one click right before the high position, you can see it switches over to low. And then if we put it in the highest position, you can see it switches over to high. So that is a quick and easy way to identify whether or not you have an input problem from the multifunction switch. And hopefully you guys can utilize this technique. Okay guys, so we got the wiper blades working. We got the GEM module communicating, but we still haven't answered the question as to why the fuse blew in the first place. Fuses don't blow by themselves. Usually there's some type of short to ground that happens that causes the fuse to overheat and blow. So initially when I started to investigate the short to ground, uh, I kind of ran into something interesting and that was the fact that there really was nowhere for a short to ground to happen between the GEM module and the fuse box because there is no physical wiring between the two units. The only place that we could have a short to ground is inside of one of the two units. For example, if we had a bad fuse box that had a bad contact inside and it was causing some type of short to ground, then it's possible that that could be a reason why the fuse blew. Another possibility could be if we had some type of water intrusion into either the fuse box or the GEM module. Water intrusion inside of modules, as you guys know, can cause all kinds of electrical problems. So I started doing a little bit of research and actually found out that there's a pretty common problem with these trucks, which involves water getting in through the windshield and making its way inside the cabin. So I decided to investigate a little bit further. Let me show you guys what I found. Okay, so let me take you underneath the dash just to show you guys how much rust we actually have underneath here. So you take a look at the bracket, you guys can see there's some surface rust going on here. Well, let me take you guys a little bit further and show you what we're dealing with here. So if you guys take a look at the two pedals, the clutch pedal and the brake pedal, you guys can see we have pretty extensive rust. Even going up to the bracket there, there's a lot of oxidation. But if you guys take a look at this uh, parking brake bracket, take a look at this bracket. Look how much rust we have uh, going on here. And this is some pretty deep rust here. We definitely have some water intrusion that's happening and it's causing all of this stuff in here to rust up. Now, the location of the GEM module is right here. And you guys can see we have a little bit of green crusty coming out of the bottom of the case here. So it's pretty evident that we may have water intrusion getting into this box. Take a closer look at that. You guys see the green crusty that's coming out of this GEM module? Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Now, another area I know a lot of you guys might mention is this harness here right up above this uh, parking brake bracket. You know, I know a lot of you guys might think that uh, the cables here or the harness could be rubbing into the bracket. But I can assure you on this one, I've already taken a close look at it and there is no damage to this harness here. These wires are all still intact and there is no short to ground happening here. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that we have some type of water intrusion into the cab of the vehicle. So at this point, really what I'm gonna do is I'm not going to recommend the customer replace the GEM module. He needs to fix this water intrusion problem first. There's no point in us putting a new module into this vehicle only for the same problem to happen again. The only problem with that is that the customer really isn't interested in fixing the windshield leak at the moment because uh, the truck actually is like an extra vehicle for them. They have it sitting most of the year. It's only used, he said, three to four times a year. They'll use the truck to maybe load up some dirt or something like that. He's not really interested in throwing a bunch of money into this thing. So at this point, he really doesn't want to go any further with it. He's happy as long as the wiper blades are working. And if the fuse blows again, then he's just going to replace it. So I guess that brings us to the end of the video. Anyways, guys, like I always say, thank you for watching the video. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it informational. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.